Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week, and this is going to be a great one. We saw the launch of a new Chinese navigation satellite, ongoing works at Boca Chica with SpaceX's Starship program, Falcon 9 launches both Starlink and Starlink competitors OneWeb and Iridium next, James Webb Space Telescope news, and much, much more. Let's crack into things. An ongoing source of speculation among Starship fans is trying to figure out which Starship will be used for the second orbital flight test. Musk already confirmed the desire to test the heat shield tiles against hypersonic speeds of re-entry, so the two clear candidates were Ship 25 and Ship 28. On a Twitter space a couple of weeks ago, Musk mentioned that SpaceX still hadn't decided on which vehicle to use. Well, perhaps this mystery is coming to a close. We recently saw Ship 25 undergo some cryoproofing tests at the former Macy's gun range site, and now it's been removed from here and transported all the way to suborbital pad B. It initially only got so far before being rolled back for unknown reasons, but then later SpaceX had another go, this time rolling it all the way to the launch zone. SpaceX later tweeted that this move was made in order for Ship 25 to begin a static fire campaign, so I'd say that it's a fairly safe indication that Ship 25 may be the vehicle SpaceX have chosen for flight number two. The other theory regarding SpaceX's plans for Ship 25 was to fly it up, SN8 style, to high altitude in order to blow it up using an upgraded flight termination system. One of the big failings during the orbital test flight was that it took around 40 seconds from the flight termination system activating to the rocket actually breaking up. This is not good. Ship destruction should be immediate if a termination command is sent. I don't think Ship 25 is going to perform such a test though. For starters, SpaceX want to static fire all six Raptor engines, when performing a high altitude flight test would only require the central three. Furthermore, it looks like another booster tank has been used to test an upgraded flight termination system. Check this out. That is test tank booster six. SpaceX had filled it with water and then, boop, <laughs> a rupture that definitely appeared to have been triggered by explosives appeared near the common dome. Upgrading the FTS was, according to Elon, the longest lead item of things to fix before the next Starship orbital flight test. Here's hoping this new system is working as, or better than, expected. Over at the launch site, repairs continue to be made to the orbital launch mount, and of course, work continues on retrofitting the water deluge system. We're starting to see this come together now. Elon stated that it would look similar to an upside down shower head, with the nozzles pointing upwards. Ryan Hansen put this excellent render together, showing how this might look when completed. Ryan also published this image, with the blue lines there representing the trajectory of the water jets. As you can see, they're angled so that they don't hit the Raptor engines themselves. Obviously, there is a lot of speculation at play here. We'll have to wait for more components to arrive at the site so we can see how this will come together, but I am a big fan of this interpretation. In terms of the water-cooled steel plate, SpaceX appear to be putting designs through the paces. Check out this video of a Raptor engine firing directly into a water-cooled steel plate test article. As you can see, the test plate does seem to be jetting out water angled away from the engine itself. As to whether or not this test was a complete success, well, SpaceX haven't directly stated, but hopefully it all went well. Speaking of tests, we did see some Starship vehicle testing last week, in the form of a Ship 26.1 cryo test, which you can just see peeking through the trees on NASA Spaceflight Starbase livestream. It's not clear what SpaceX were trying to achieve with this test, but hopefully they got the results that they wanted. As for ships still under construction, last week Ship 29 inched higher as stacking continued in the high bay next to Ship 28. As you know, SpaceX are the sole contractors, selected by NASA, to build the human landing system for Artemis 3 and 4. But we had some big news last week from NASA and Blue Origin. It looks like Team Blue is back in the race. Blue Origin and their partners will be working on creating a lunar lander, as well as a cislunar transporter. These vehicles will be powered by Hydrolox rocket fuel, which has a high specific impulse, making it a great choice for deep space missions. However, this fuel type is a bit susceptible to boiling off during long mission timelines, which is why things like the Apollo program used less efficient but easier to store hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide fuels. As part of this project, Blue Origin and team will be working on developing new technologies like solar-powered 20-degree Kelvin cryocoolers to prevent the fuel from boiling off. This means that they'll be able to use the high-performance Hydrolox fuel for future missions beyond the moon and even use lunar ice to make liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen propellants right there on the moon itself. 
Curiously, in order for all of this to work, this mission will require orbital refueling of the Hydrolox, lest we forget the harsh criticisms Blue Origin levied against SpaceX for needing to use on-orbit refueling. I recall immensely complex being thrown around. <laughs> I'm not an expert, but I think that transferring Hydrolox will be a lot more complex than transferring Methalox, Starship's fuel, but we'll have to just wait and see. I'm a big fan of competition, so I welcome Blue Origins joining in the Artemis program. Before Artemis 5 can happen though, Blue Origin will need to finish and fly New Glenn, build the lander and demonstrate that it can successfully land on the moon uncrewed, and figure out the immense complexities of orbital refueling. So I can't really see this happening any earlier than 2030, and that's been generous. Another project that Blue Origin is working on is Jarvis, their answer to Starship. It's a reusable upper stage for New Glenn, and in typical Blue Origin style, very little is known about the progress of this. But look here, this image was shared by Tom McCool, showing what looks like a test tank out in the wild. Yeah, definitely getting some Starship SN4 vibes here. <laughs> SpaceX took to the stage with their Falcon 9 launch vehicle last week with Starlink Group 6-3. The launch happened at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. Bright and early on Friday, we saw Falcon 9 carry 22 Starlink satellites to low Earth orbit. The low number of satellites is because these were the beefier Starlink V2 minis. This was only SpaceX's third time launching these. After separating from the second stage, the Falcon 9 gracefully landed on the drone ship a short fall of Gravitas, stationed in the Atlantic Ocean. This specific first stage was B-1076, which has seen action in four previous missions. CRS-26, OneWeb-16, Intelsat IS-40E, and another Starlink mission. But wait, there's more. On Saturday, SpaceX's Falcon 9 was at it again, this time launching from Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. This launch carried five Iridium Next satellites, 15 OneWeb satellites, and a demonstration satellite called JoeySat, all to low Earth orbit. It's interesting that SpaceX is launching Starlink competitors, right? Iridium Next, OneWeb, and Starlink are all satellite communication systems that provide global coverage. But while they offer similar services, there are some differences between them. Iridium Next focuses on voice and data communication, while Starlink and OneWeb aim to provide high-speed internet access. While both Starlink and OneWeb have very similar goals, any claims of rivalry have been downplayed by OneWeb, saying that Starlink targets consumers, while OneWeb is targeting enterprise and government clients. The other payload was the aforementioned JoeySat. This will demonstrate key technologies for OneWeb's next generation constellation, allowing a single satellite to serve people over a wide geographical area by rapidly switching focus between different locations. Anyway, back to the rocket. The first stage of the Falcon 9 had a smooth landing on the drone ship Of Course I Still Love You, stationed in the Pacific Ocean. This particular first stage was B-1063, which has previously been part of 10 missions, Sentinel-6, Dart, Transporter 7, and 7 Starlink missions. There's one Falcon 9 mission I can't talk about just yet because it hasn't happened for me yet, but provided it launches without delay, it will have happened for you. SpaceX is planning to launch Axiom Space's Axiom Mission 2 to the International Space Station. The Dragon spacecraft this mission previously supported the Crew 4 mission to the station. During their time on the ISS, the Axiom 2 crew will perform more than 20 science and technology experiments in areas like human physiology and physical sciences. These experiments aim to expand knowledge for the benefit of life on Earth in areas such as healthcare, materials, technology development, and industrial advancements. I'll be sure to cover this launch on next week's episode of Space This Week, so make sure you're subscribed by clicking that button down below, and of course ring the bell, and of course like the video as well if you are enjoying the ride so far. Anyway, moving on to China, a Long March 3B launch vehicle took off on the 17th of May from the Zichang Satellite Launch Center. It carried the very first backup Beidou 3 navigation satellite. This geostationary satellite, the 56th in the Beidou family, will act as the first in-orbit replacement unit for the Chinese GNSS network. Lastly, in our list of launches from last week, and still in China, we saw a Long March 2C launch vehicle take to the skies on Sunday, carrying the Macau Science 1A and B satellites, and the Lugia 201 satellite from the Jiquan Satellite Launch Center. The Macau Science 1 satellites were put into a near-equatorial orbit to monitor the geomagnetic field and space environment. As for the Lugia 201, it's a scientific experiment satellite with little else really shared. Quite intriguing. <laughs> The James Webb Space Telescope has made an incredible discovery. It has found evidence of enormous stars, or celestial monsters, hiding in the early universe. 
These supermassive stars, up to 10,000 times the mass of our Sun, could help us understand how heavy elements were formed in the early universe. Researchers found traces of these giant stars in ancient globular clusters, which are clumps of tightly packed stars. These clusters provide a glimpse into the earliest years of our universe. The discovery suggests that the chemical variety observed in some stars could be explained by the existence of these cosmic giants, which burned their fuel at extremely high temperatures. Finding these stars has been challenging, due to their short lifespans and explosive deaths. By studying the light emitted from different globular clusters, the researchers found high levels of nitrogen, indicating the presence of these supermassive stars. This exciting discovery opens the door to further exploration of other galaxies and clusters to see if these celestial monsters exist elsewhere. Lao Aerospace had a quiet one last week, but I didn't get a chance to make more KSP content because I've just been super busy with work and I went mountain biking for the weekend, so I didn't really have much time to make Kerbal content. But there is a video now on my second channel of my mountain bike endeavours. If that interests you, I'll link it on the end card. Quick update to my channel. The rest of May and the beginning of June are going to be very hectic for me in real life, so I'm not really sure how much Kerbal content I can make. However, I have been making some big changes behind the scenes so that, starting from maybe the middle of June, I should be able to get video production back up to speed, aiming for two to three videos per week. And a lot of this restructuring is made possible by all the names on screen. My Patreon supporters and channel members, your financial support makes all of this content possible, so a huge sincere thank you from me is owed one. Once again and of course thank you for watching this video i hope you enjoyed it and i'll catch you in the next one